Uh, good afternoon. We are going to start today completing the characteristics of uh, traffic system elements. Uh, in the previous lectures, we discussed the road user characteristics, the vehicle characteristics, and uh, the, the highway characteristics. Now we are going to uh, uh, discuss the characteristics of the traffic uh, control devices. So what do we mean with control devices? Control devices are basically uh, uh, are the media by which traffic engineers communicate with drivers. Virtually every traffic law regulations or operating uh, instruction must be communicated through the use of devices that fall into three broad categories. We have three broad categories for control devices. First of all, the traffic markings which is the painting on the road, okay? The traffic signs, that these are the mounted plates on the side of the road or uh, uh, overhanging uh, on the highway, and the traffic signals. These are the three media of communication with drivers regarding the regulations, the warning, the law, okay? Uh, uh, that these are the three media. Okay, in order for this communication to be consistent and uniform, there is something called the Manual on Traffic uh, Control Devices, Ma Manual on Uniform Co uh, Traffic Control Devices, MUTCD. Okay, this MUTCD, there's a, a copy of it, uh, it's a GCC copy, pretty much based on uh, it's 95% of the content are based on the MUTCD. So, uh, you know, we are going to be discussing the MUTCD in this course. Uh, okay, traffic control device. What is con what are the contents of the manual of uniform on, uni on uniform control devices? The purpose of this uh, uh, document is basically to promote highway safety and efficiency by providing for orderly movement of all road users and streets and highways throughout the nation. That's basically the written purpose of it. Okay, how can the MUTCD uh, uh, achieve, you know, achieve that, you know, uh, that goal? In, or in order to fulfill this mission, okay, uh, there are some specifications or some requirements for control devices. First of all, the control devices, the control device must fulfill a need. That means you don't put a traffic sign or uh, uh, make a pavement marking that there is no need for. Okay. Uh, it, need, it must command attention. What do we mean with command attention? that you know okay let's go first for the fulfilling a need okay and you know to give you an example uh, don't put uh, you know uh, no parking here on a highway going through the desert is there is a need to put this sign no uh, that's an example that it's, it must be relevant okay second uh, command attention Command attention, what do we mean? That it should be of a size and magnitude and color that the driver will pay attention to. So that's what we mean with command attention. Convey a clear, simple message. That means you don't, you know, you cannot put a traffic sign, okay, with a paragraph written on it. No, no driver will have the, actually it will, it will, it, it will be a, a safety hazard for the highway because drivers will start reading okay this message and might get involved in accidents so you must have a you know a very concise and very uh, short message simple message uh, for command respect of road users again we go to the first example doesn't make sense to put a sign on uh, on a on a freeway going through the desert okay and on the side, you say, 
no parking here. Okay? Or uh, on, uh, on a freeway, and you put a sign and say, okay, speed 60 kilometers per hour. That doesn't make sense. Okay? Uh, five, uh, give adequate time for proper response. As we mentioned before, in the road user characteristics, we have perception reaction time. So if you have an exit on, uh, on a freeway, don't put the sign that the exit here, okay, right at the exit. You need to put it ahead of the exit, okay, with a distance that are relevant for the drivers to make a decision and make and, and take that turn or take, take that exit, okay? Any questions so far? Okay. What are the core contents for the MUTCD? Okay. First of all, what are, you know, the contents of the MUCD are three basic contents. First of all, it contains standards for the physical design of the device. That means the dimensions, okay, the font, the geometry of the device, okay? Uh, whether it's a, it's a sign or it's a pavement marking or a traffic signal. Two, it gives detailed standards and guidelines on where the device should be located. That means it gives you, you know, the location relative to the highway, where it should be. Third, and that's a very important one, okay, which is basically the warrants or in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in layman term, that's the conditions that justify the use of this particular device, okay? It, you know, and the, and the guidelines. To give an example for the detailed standard, that's one of the core components, which is basically the standards and the design and the dimensions, okay? Then the, these, are the, these are from the MUTCD, by the way. Uh, it gives you the the, the, the the dimensions or the the dimensions where to put it, you know, on the highway. So in the first one here, uh, this one, this is on a rural highway. This one is on a street in the city, and as you can see, there is a, a minimum two feet from the curbside. Why? Can someone explain to me? why this two feet minimum and why this one is 12 feet minimum. Hmm? I need some participation here. Uh, to make it uh, easier to read on the line si and eyesight of the driver. Well, who's speaking? Uh, me, Ahmed Shemri. Ahmed Shemri. Uh, that's for the, the, the rural area or the urban? The urban area. The urban, okay? Okay, what about the rural area? Why, the, you know, we didn't leave just two feet from the pavement? Uh, the road uh, doesn't seem to be leveled. Maybe that's why. Okay, that's a good try, but that's not actually correct. Uh, thank you anyway. Uh, some, some, Someone else? Come on, guys. Okay. First of all, here, a rural area, this area is shoulder. Okay. So we leave minimum 12 feet. Why? So if there's a vehicle that is disabled, it can go and exit and park here. Okay, so if there is a traffic sign here, you know, somewhere here, it's going to block that. Okay, or might get hit by a car or something. But here, vehicles are not allowed to grow over the, uh, you know, to go over the curb. But we leave at least two feet minimum. That's for the mirrors of the trucks. Okay. So we, you know, this way, this side, the sign is not going to hit by the mirror 
of a truck or a bus. Clear? As you can see here, in this side, this is a, a shoulder, okay? And there's, again, there's six feet. The total distance from here to here is basically 12 feet to allow a vehicle to exit uh, 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 from the road, you know, and park on the side of the road. Okay? Okay. So, as we as we uh, shown before here, we have detailed standards for the design and the geometry. And here we have the, the placement guidelines and the distance where it should be mounted and stuff like that. Then the last one, they, these are the warrants or the conditions when you need to, to, to you know, to, to, you, to use this control sign. For, for example, these are the, the, the warrants for a stop sign. It gives you a guidance, recommendation at intersections where a full stop is not necessarily at all times, consideration should be first given to using less restrictive yield sign. So here, you know, giving a recommendation that, you know, before going to the stop sign, examine first the yield sign. Then, gives you the, the warrants for the stop sign, okay? The use of stop signs on minor street approaches should be considered if engineering judgment indicates that this, a stop is always required because one or more, so that's the condition. One or more of the following conditions. One, the vehicular traffic volume on the through street is uh, or uh, highway exceeds 6,000 vehicles per, per, uh, per day. That means if this condition uh, is satisfied, then put it a stop sign. A uh, restricted view, the site, uh, you know, the geometry of the intersection does not allow drivers to, to see, uh, you know, the upcoming traffic. A crash record, accident records. So here it says that if the crash records, you know, uh, that three or more crashes, okay, that are susceptible to correction by an installation of a stop sign. And if you, if you, if you have within 12 months, you see, hold a second. For, for, uh, as we mentioned, if there's a, a three accidents, okay, within three accidents, three or more, within 12 months period, or five accidents or more, okay, within two years. And the reason for these accidents, you know, you know, lack of, uh, of stopping or there's a, you know, it could be corrected with a stop sign, then we put a stop sign. Okay, Shabab? Okay. Okay, doctor. So now, what are the type of the traffic signs? We are gonna first start with the traffic signs. What are the type of traffic signs? We have three categories. The first category is basically regulatory signs. The second is warning signs. And the third is guide signs. The regulatory signs here, these to convey information okay, concerning specific traffic reg regulations. That means if you don't follow what it says, then you have a traffic violation. For example, give you speed limit, okay, give you the right of way, whether this one way or two way, or, or, you know, and so on. Lane usage, parking, okay, and variety of other functions. So if you violate this one, okay, this is a traffic violation. Then the second category, which is basically a warning sign. It give you, gives the driver the warning on your, uh, you know, uh, to inform the driver on, on upcoming hazard or something like that. Then there's the guide signs. The guide signs tell you, you know, for, you know, from this exit, you can go to street, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, if you go, uh, you know, this city after this, uh, you know, through this uh, highway and so on. So these are regulatory signs. If you violate these signs, you get a, a, a ticket for violations. Again, 
you know, here, for example, give you that's no turn right. If you turn right, you made a violation. If say, for, the, for example, here say uh, left turn only. If you don't follow this, you have a problem and so on. These are warning signs. The, the, you know, typically they have a, a yellow background. They give you, you know, for example, you are going through a curve and this is the recommended speed. Okay, by the way, most of these numbers are in mile per hour. Okay, not kilometers per hour. So you have to pay attention to that. Uh, for example, here, it give you a warning that there's a stop sign ahead. There's a traffic signal ahead, okay? Or maybe there's a slippery road and so on. And the last category, which is basically the guide signs, it has a, a green background, as you can see. The green background, it gives you, you know, around for, uh, you know, this is the, uh, on a roundabout that uh, uh, Allwood Road uh, East and, and so on. Give you directions, information, like these ones. Okay. So we discussed first the traffic signs and we said that the traffic signs, they have uh, three categories, regulatory and uh, warning and informative. The second category, which is the pavement marking. The pavement marking can be divided into three, longitudinal marking, okay, and transverse and object markers. These are the, you know, like a cat eyes on the streets and stuff like that. Okay, so what are the longitudinal markings? That's an example for longitudinal markings. Lane dividers, okay? You know, here, these are lane dividers, edge of the road, okay? These are longitudinal pavement marking. By the way, the colors here are different than the colors that we have, okay? Uh, for example, here, the... the uh, the arrows for the turns, this is a left turn, okay, and these are the arrows for it. This is the, the, the longitudinal marking that there is a storage uh, uh, lane for the left turn, okay, and so on. Or, uh, you know, in drawing islands at, uh, at an exits and ramps like this one. All of these are examples for longitudinal markings. Then the transverse marking. Transverse are basically perpendicular to the direction of the flow. So again, the longitudinal, it's parallel to the direction of flow. Okay, the uh, perpendicular, okay, that's the flow, it should be, you know, across. So uh, these are warning for a speed hump or a stop sign or a stop line like this one here. That's basically at pedestrian crossing, okay? Or here to mark a pedestrian crossing or a crosswalk marking like these ones. These are for pedestrian to, to marking the area that pedestrians should be crossing from. Or uh, parking spots. These are transverse marking. Also the arrows are transverse marking. These are for uh, uh, speed humps without uh, uh, crosswalks. And to look at the total picture, look at, uh, uh, you know, roundabouts and the markings in the roundabouts. It has, a cons you know, a group of uh, pavement marking. This is a single lane roundabout. This is a two lane uh, roundabout. This is a three lane roundabout pavement marking. Then signals. Signals, basically, the most important part of it, 
is basically the, the warrants for the signals. So that's an example for a signal warrant uh, for an intersect, you know, at an intersection. It has nine warrants. At first, it has the eight hour uh, vehicle volume, the four hour vehicle volume, the peak hour, the pedestrian volume. If there's a, a school crossing, you know, if there's a coordinated signal system, crash experience, all these are, you know, at least three or four of these, I think, are sufficient to have a traffic signal. Any questions so far? Okay, so this way we conclude discussing the uh, uh, characteristics for the element of the transportation, for, for the traffic system. We discussed road user characteristics. We uh, discussed uh, uh, vehicle characteristics. We discussed uh, traffic stream characteristics and traffic control devices, device characteristics. Okay. Now we are going to move on to traffic studies. First of all, I assume that all of you have uh, studied statistics before. So we will just have a, a quick review for statistics. Then we will discuss volume two, two, two fundamental traffic studies, the volume studies and the speed studies. Okay. So what is statistics? Basically statistics is the art of abstracting real world via sampling. If we say that this is the real world, Okay, if we need to make a judgment or to, to have a, you know, an assessment or a criteria for this real world, okay, we cannot measure the real world entirely. So what we do, we take this small sample, then we make a data reduction, we put it through a mathematical modeling, okay, then we come up with descriptive measures for the real world with a degree of confidence. Okay, then we make decision based on that and designs. As I mentioned in the in the first lecture, we discussed about we, we talked about the 85th percentile and the 15th percentile. Simply, we cannot, you know, measure the perception reaction times for all drivers on the road. Okay, we cannot measure the walking speed for everybody on the street. Okay. So what we, you know, how we do that, we just take a sample, reasonable sample size, and come up with a descriptive measures for that real world with a certain degree of confidence. Okay. Uh, when do we need uh, statistics? When we cannot measure all the data values for the population, as I mentioned before. Before starting, what do we need to address? First of all, we need to determine the sample size, you know, how many measurements are sufficient. Then what confidence should I have in the results? Okay. How much confidence, you know, how, and uh, what is statistical model distribution or the mathematical model that describe the observed data? Then uh, we might need the, the statistics to answer did the traffic engineering solution that we proposed or we, uh, you know, deployed made a real difference so that's the, the conditions here the first uh, part of uh, of the analysis is basically we draw the uh, frequency histogram for the data and the cumulative frequency percentile that's where we put here the you know this is the 15th percentile and that should be the value corresponding to the 15th percentile. And here, the value corresponds to the 85th percentile, because that's 85%. Okay? So that's just uh, then after that we have a measure for central tendencies okay look at it as if you are trying to get the centroid of the data so basically that's the mean okay which is basically 
the average of all observations. That's the sample mean. It's not the mean for the population. We need to understand this. Then we have two values, other and uh, you know, other values, median and the mode. What is the median and what the mode? I think all of you know that the median is the value corresponding to to the 50th percentile. So if we look at the 50 percent here, take the line here, then we go down. So that's the median. Why? Because the median by definition is the value that uh, above 50% and below 50%. That 50% of the observations are greater than and 50% of the observations are lesser than this value. Okay. Then the mode, look at the one with the high frequency then that's the mode. Okay. So, then, as we mentioned, here we have the measures of central tendency. That's equivalent to, you know, calculating the centroid of the data. Okay. But, here the measure of measures of dispersion okay what do we mean with the measure of dispersion that's how much the data are spread around the the mean for example if we have a group of data like this and this is the the, the average here compare this to uh, another one that is like this. And this is centroid here for the data. What are the difference between two, these two th sets? answer please if we're assuming that both they have the same number of observations number of, ob of observations in both is the same between these two sets is very simple these observations are surrounding or close to the mean <coughs> these observations are spread all over the place. Okay, so if we calculate the variance for S for this sample, okay, let's say this is S2 square, and here we will have S1 square. Which one is greater, S1 square or S2 square? S2. Variance for the first group greater, okay, than the second group or lesser? Second, akbar than the first one. The second is greater than the second, the first one. That's Yusuf. Correct? Yeah. Okay. Uh, how many of you agree with that? All of us. Oh, you're speaking for everybody, Khalil, huh? <laughs> like that. Huh? Yes. Okay. To, to have a better understanding for this, think of it as the moment of inertia around the centroid. I know you are all are structural engineers. So look at this. It's xi minus x bar square. Okay? So that's similar, the top part, is similar to the first moment of area, okay? So the higher the inertia here, that means the data quality is bad and the standard deviation is high. That means, you know, which one is better data? S1 is better data than S2, okay? So we have uh, the variance and the standard deviation. Both of these values, okay, 
uh, gives an, uh, a measure for how much uh, dispersion in the, in, the, in the observations are there, is there. Uh, also, uh, there is the coefficient of variation and there is the skewness, okay? The coefficient of variation, it's basically, it measures the standard deviation divided by the mean of the sample. But the skewness, skewness basically gives an indication for the symmetry of the data, okay? Uh, we can, you know, do all of these uh, statistical analysis using Excel functions, okay? And here I mentioned for you the, 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 the function that you can use to, you know, get these values. You can refer to it and use it later. Okay, and this is also some helpful tricks for plotting frequency diagrams and, uh, you know, uh, frequency uh, histogram. Then we go now to the standard error and true mean and the sample size. First of all, as we mentioned before, the case that I showed you where we have two sets of, uh, of data and one of them, the standard deviation was high, okay? There's what we call standard error. The standard error is basically dividing the standard deviation by the square root of n, okay? So that's what we call standard error, okay? This is assuming that the error is distributed uh, uh, normally around the true mean, okay? Uh, so if we want to get the true mean range, okay, out of the sample mean, it depends on the degree of confidence. So if we have a degree of confidence, 67%, you remember, you, I think you have studied the normal distribution and you know that after one sigma, uh, two sigmas, okay, here minus one sigma, minus two sigmas, this area from one sigma to one sigma, it's 67 percent from uh, 1.96 to 1.96 plus and minus this area will be 95 percent all of you know these values or not some of us yes and the other no i th i'm assuming that all of you have studied already statistics Yes, because, because of that, I'm saying some of that, no. Uh, some students are not taking statistics till now. I have not taken statistics until now. Okay. Okay, we will elaborate on this later. However, if we are looking at, you know, uh, degree of confidence, 67%, we are going to add plus or minus a one standard error. If we have a degree of confidence, 95, that means we have... 1.96 sigma, okay? So we add to the mean one po and subtract 1.96 uh, standard errors that define the range for the true mean. Okay, now to get the sample size, hmm, depending on the, uh, uh, first of all, the allowable error here and N will be the sample size. So if the allowable er error, uh, you know, is set for us and we know the standard deviation, we can calculate the uh, uh, sample size. At the degree of confidence, 67%, uh, that's gonna be the sample size, N equals standard deviation divided by the error squared. At degree of confidence, 95%, then this is gonna be the value for N for the sample size at degree of confidence, 99.5%, this is going to be the uh, sample size. Okay, the first traffic study we uh, shall discuss is basically speed study. 
or speed studies. Speed studies are one of the, the you know, we have, uh, first of all, the spot speed studies, okay? And this is defined as the average speed of vehicles passing a point on a highway, which is basically the time mean speed that we discussed last week. Usually we conduct uh, the speed studies in the case of free flow condition, you know? We don't conduct speed studies during, you know, congested flow. And uh, for freeway, for example, if the traffic volume was 750 to 1,000 vehicles per hour per lane, that's the, the limit for measuring speed studies. For other types, if the volume is less than 500 vehicles uh, per hour per lane. Uh, the speed definition of interest, basically the average or time mean speed, the standard deviation, the 85th percentile of speed, and the median speed. These are the four uh, values that we look for. Okay, when, where do we use the spot speed study or the spot speed data? To determine speed limit for applications, okay, to assess speed limit enforcement and for other specific applications. For example, to determine level of service, as we will discuss later, or for signal timing, estimating the yellow and uh, or red times, uh, or to determine the needed uh, side distance, or for safety and accident analysis. The first method, which is basically the manual method. The manual method is very simple, okay? All what you need is basically a stopwatch and two marks on the highway. For example, if you have a, a light pole here, okay? and another light pole here, and you mark once a car, you know, pass this virtual line in front of that mark, okay? You start the stopwatch. Once it reached to the second mark, okay, you press again the stopwatch and you calculate the time, okay? Then you take this several times, you get different speeds and voila, you have uh, uh, sample data, okay? The advantage of this method, it's simple, okay? But the disadvantage of this method is the high error due to the stopwatch depressing time variations. That means if we are talking about 40 meter distance, okay? Uh, and there's an error in, the, in, in pressing and releasing the stopwatch, okay? And there's variation from one person to another person. Okay, this variation, if you take it into account, you will get, you know, a very high uh, error and, or, you know, variability between uh, people in this, uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in this method. And I used usually to give an example and I ask uh, all the students to, you know, clamp a hand and press the, you know, the, uh, their stopwatches once and press it again. And we usually get times variable. For example, if we, if we conduct this experiment, we'll have for, you know, on average 0.2 second, you know, difference between other, you know, uh, uh, all students. If this distance was maybe taking uh, one second or 1.2 second, 1.8 seconds say, and there's an error plus or minus 0.2, how much, okay, speed difference we will get. So just try this example with me. Divide 40, once divided by 1.6, and again, 40 divided by two seconds. How much do we have? 40 divided by 1.6 is 25. Yes. 25, that's meter per second. Multiplied by 3.6 will be 90 kilometers per hour, okay? Yes. 40 divided by two, that's 20 meter per second, okay? Multiply with 3.6, how much you will get? 72. 72. Can you see the difference? 
and this is kilometer per hour. Just the error of 0.2 seconds give you this variability, 72 to 90. How much? A range of 18 kilometers per hour. This is not acceptable. Okay, and this error is not for from sampling. No, that's error from the device of measuring the speed. You see my point? So this is not acceptable. If we divide it by two, so it's basically this this uh, this point two se uh, uh, plus or minus point two second can translate to plus or minus nine kilometer per hour error. You see, so this one is not highly recommended. But if you have nothing else to do, you got to do what you got to do. The second method, which is basically using the Doppler radar or the speed gun, okay? The speed gun, how does it work? It, you have a radar here, okay? It sends a, 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 you know, a bunch of, of waves, you know, thrust of waves, okay, like this. And it has, a, you know, a, a wavelength. That's the initial, initial wavelength. Then once it hit the target, okay, it reflects. So we have the lambda reflected, the wavelength of the reflected wave. Of course, if the target is moving, okay, the reflected wavelength will be greater than the initial wavelength, okay? Based on this, if we calculate it here, lambda reflect, uh, reflected equal lambda initial plus or minus one over the frequency or the initial frequency multiplied by the speed of the target. Plus or minus depends on the direct direction. That means if the, if the, the, the target going this way, then it's going to be plus, that's going to be the, the reflected wavelength would be longer. If it's going the other way, then it's going to be negative. Okay? So that's how the radar, uh, uh, you know, measures the speed of the, of the, of a moving target. Okay? But it's important to uh, mention, basically, uh, the radar evaluates the reflected frequency and calculate the frequency of refle uh, reflected. And based on that, based on the two frequencies, you can determine the target speed. Clear? Okay. What is the advantage? <coughs> the accuracy is much higher. Of course, the accuracy here compared to this method okay, is much higher. But there is still error. Why? There is a sampling error in the, in the measurements itself. There is a processing time error, okay? But the error in this specific machine, I remember it was plus or minus, I think, one uh, kilometer per hour, okay? That's good, but there is a disadvantage. Usually, first of all, it's difficult to conceal this, uh, this, this, this tool, okay? And usually when you see someone on the street with a speed gun in their hand, what do you expect? Hmm? Traffic police, okay? So regardless, if you are driving within the speed limit, hmm, when people see someone with a speed gun, they try to slow. They try to be disciplined. I'm not, I'm not talking if they are already exceeding the speed limit, okay? But even those that are, you know, of course, if someone is exceeding the speed limit, okay, they will slow down, okay? So that's one of the major disadvantages, that it's difficult to conceal, and drivers associate the radar with police, okay? So that might end up giving you, uh, you know, 
unrealistic uh, values for the actual speed on the highway. In order to avoid that, okay, we usually we select a location that you hide behind the tree and try to measure the speed of the cars from the back. So that's way. Also, there is an important correction that we need to do for the, the, the measured values, which is getting the true speed. As we mentioned in the explanation, the apparatus give you, or the, the, the speed gun give you the speed if you measure it from the back, okay, it gives you V. So if I am measuring and I have an angle, what do I get? You get basically the component of the speed on that line of, you know, or, or the aiming direction. That means the readings that you get is basically this value, the projection of the speed on this value, on this uh, uh, direction, okay? So basically you get this value. So you have to correct by measuring this theta and dividing the speed observation that you, that, that you measured from the speed gun by the cosine, okay? Because basically you are measuring the component on the direction of measurements. There's a direction of measurements and that's the true speed. And basically you are getting this part of the vector. Okay, we're getting this part only. Wada? Okay. Uh, spot speed uh, uh, study, first you have to do uh, the graphical, the uh, graphical represent, you know, as we mentioned, you do the frequency diagram, okay? Then you do the cumulative uh, frequency diagram, as we can see here, okay? Then uh, you give the measures, which is the statistical measures, which is basically the quantitative, the mode, the median, the mean, the standard deviation, the 85th percentile speed and the 15th percentile speed, and the uh, pace, which is basically the 15 kilometer uh, per hour band. Then we do uh, data analysis for the speed. We calculate the standard error. Okay. Okay, then we calculate the true mean at certain degree of confidence. Clear? Okay, let me, I think we are gonna stop today right here and we will continue uh, later on that, inshallah.